From Good Shepherd Auditorium in Inwood, New York City, welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where you meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes that make their home here, what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims. Today, we welcome choreographer Gabrielle Lamb. Gabrielle is a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow and is based in New York City, where she directs Pigeon Wing Dance, described by The New Yorker as eccentric, playful, curious. Her work is presented by the American Ballet Theater Incubator, the New York Choreographic Institute, the MIT Museum, the Juilliard School, Jacob's Pillow, and Dance on Camera at Lincoln Center, and many others. She has won fellowships and competitions at Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, Milwaukee Ballet, and the Banff Center, and many others as well, including a Princess Grace Award. She's a native of Savannah, Georgia, and trained at the Boston Ballet School, and was a longtime soloist at Le Grand Ballet Canadiens, later performing with Morphosis, The Whedon Company, and Pontius Lindbergh Dance in New York City. She's been lauded by Dance Magazine as, quote, a dancer of stunning clarity who illuminates the smallest details and qualities she brings to the dance she makes, too. We're going to talk to her about her work and so much more, but first, let me welcome you, Gabrielle. Great to be here. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for finally taking some time to talk. It seems like every time we talk, we're in some kind of mad rush to get things going for a show. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Putting out fires. Putting out fires. Sending MP3s to yeah. making sure <laughs> dancers are there, or not. Choreographers are there. Choreographers yeah. are there. <laughs> Last time we, uh, we, uh, we, for those of you who have seen her before, or heard her before uh, on mic at our Filmworks Off Fresco series the past couple of years, right? And uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you up and and present your work, uh, and uh, and of course the work of the dancers because a lot of it's improv as well. Um, so we're going to give credit credits due. Uh, but um, I want to start off with an origin story, which I've good good story should begin. I feel. Um, how did pigeon wing dance come to be, and what makes it unique? Mm. Uh, so pigeon wing dance, <clears throat> I would say it, it started before its name was pigeon wing. When I first moved to New York and was trying to focus on choreography, I started creating on a very small scale with, uh, at first just one dancer and then two and more. And for a while it was a project without a name. And then we had a, um, commission through the CUNY dance initiative to do, uh, like a full evening of my work down at Baruch, um, performing arts center. And I thought, well, this is a little bit more formal engagement. I think this thing needs more of a name. I felt very resistant for a long time to saying that I had a company. It felt, um, pretentious or something, but I'm like, all right, let's just go ahead and name it. And so easy I had, for grant applications, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I knew I didn't want it to have my name. And so I had a little tournament of names on post-it notes and I had gone through the thesaurus and um, just looked for names of dances and and Pigeon Wing is sort of a, um, well, it's a name for a tap step, I believe, but it's also a French aile de pigeon for for a ballet step as well. Um, And so I thought it was a ridiculous name when I first came up with it, but I wrote it down on a post-it note, put it down there with all the others, and somehow that's, um, after rounds of elimination, it kind of grew on me, and so Pigeon Wing came to be, yeah. I I pictured on my mind a short film, you trying to figure out a name for your company. Yeah, Uh, and um, I think, well, you know, what, what makes it unique, it's the... Um, the dancers who were most used to doing, um, to working in my choreographic language, the people that I've worked with over several years, maybe some of them I worked with first in a, like a university setting. And then after they graduated, they said they'd really like to work with me more. And so, you know, these are the dancers that I think I can express through them most clearly the movement ideas that I'm interested in. And I feel like I can go really far with them. I feel comfortable with them in the studio to try new things I haven't tried before. And so, yeah, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we also started doing performances outdoors on a, on an on a carpet it was at first a five by eight carpet now it's eight by ten but i would say growing we're growing (laughs) (laughs) we've scaled up as much as we could within that model i think um yeah so i would say in terms of what kind of performances we do uh, that 
would really distinguish us from other companies. I would say that's become, you know, part of our signature, although we still yeah. do other indoor performances, dance films, et cetera. Right. I'll hop to that. You know, it's like, uh, as I said, Inward Artworks presented you guys a couple summers now and um, at the Alfresco. And one of, one of the things I love about this particular series is that it makes dance accessible anywhere oh, yeah. by providing a framework, uh, literally mm -hmm. the size of the carpet, um, a Persian rug, if you will, um, that grounds not only the artists, but also, you know, the choreography and the improvisation. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that was, you know, real tip of the hat to you for finding that um, and how to, you know, it's creating a, I don't want to say a safe space, but I guess it is in a way, but more along of an empowering space for creativity to thrive. Mm. And, uh, and it's not just a, uh, a, th a third three walls thing. It's, it can be a four wall thing yeah. as well. It, I mean, it functions, it's very interesting. It functions like a proscenium does in that it frames a dance. And we're always trying to find new platforms for dance. But there is a reason why this proscenium exists. It helpful, it's helpful for a viewer to know, all right, this is where I should be looking right now. This is where I should focus my attention. Um, and yet it is, unlike a proscenium, you can, you can, in a lot of the places we perform, the audience is on all four sides of us. They can see from many different angles. So I really, I don't think I would ever have done this if not for the pandemic and right. the sort of sense of desperation to keep on sure. creating in any way possible. But it has really changed the way I think about um, the relationship between dancers and choreographers and their audience and what kind of people can be interested in watching concert dance given the opportunity. Well, you kind of answered my second question. Follow up with that. It's like, you know, what have you learned in these three years of doing this? Because it, it makes you think about how to approach and also like what's like what's necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think my my kind of choreography was particularly suited to this because I always did a, I always worked with a lot of small details. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, sometimes when I'm working in a larger space, I do struggle to get people consistently moving with it, like uh, on a large scale within the space because um, I get really interested in small details, creating close up as one does in a New York City studio. And so I, I think my movement vocabulary was really well suited to this, to being framed by this small carpet. But in terms of I, I think I just was very surprised about um, how many people that I wouldn't have is expected to be interested were in fact interested and captivated and stopped to watch. You know, um, I guess I had accepted this conventional wisdom that ballet in particular, which is where I come from, was sort of a um, elitist niche art form that not everyone could appreciate or would appreciate. And that that notion has really been turned on its head. And I think, yeah, I, um, a lot of times before the pandemic, I really questioned, like, why am I doing this? Who is this for? Because when you do, especially when you have a small contemporary company, a lot of times you're dancing for your friends and family. Yes. Um, and so it's been really wonderful for me and for the dancers to to feel that there can be a wider interest in, in what we do and that it, it can be part of everyone's everyday life. It's not just friend art. No, no, it doesn't have to be. Um, yeah. Or and also that dance can, I mean, we've had people come up and say, like, this performance meant so much to me. I've had such a hard week and, you know, this really changed my mood. I'm like, wow, can dance actually do that? Because I'm so close to it that yeah. that's not my experience of dance. Right. Certainly of music it can be. But yeah, to learn that, especially when people happen upon something by accident, that it can really shift their their mood and their, Yeah. Sure. And also, I think context means everything, too, with this, right? It's like where you do it, like where yeah. you choose to do it. Same thing, like I learned from the podcast, like we were, you know, a lot of people, this would be taboo for people to record a podcast on location mm. somewhere. They have to, you know, has to be in a studio. It yeah, has to yeah. be in a foamed room with perfect headphones audio, and perfect yeah. audio and like. The part of this is that, you know, we do these on locations in the neighborhood in mm. various locations. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's a, it's a, the, the neighborhood is a character. Yeah. You know what I mean? The context is everything. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like just going back to the last one we did with you all, the very end of August, uh, before, um, I think it was before we did the Alfred Hitchcock movie, I mm -hmm. think, right? It's like a, no, not so, Vertigo. 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 Yeah. I mean, how, Oddly, I mean, it, the pairing went down so well. Did it? I didn't get to stay for the film because I had an early flight, but I was very curious about how that would go. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it did. And um, people were so... Well, first off, you know how they... You came, I think, whatever, at least, least, least a 
third of the way, at least through your piece. Because she's a working girl, folks. She's moving around. <laughs> no, I was uh, like, I was at the passport office. At, like, oh, until, yeah. I remember you were yeah. leaving the next morning, right? I was right? leaving the next morning yeah. to go to Canada. So, yeah. Gosh. And that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, how she got her pie, how, how she got, what she went through, what she went through to get her passport is a whole different story. Um, but she, she, you made it. I made it. You yeah. made it. And, and you could see the, uh, the audience was so engaged. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think, too, it was like, well, you know, it's funny like you're doing things. Um, just purely speaking, you have this. Not to, I'm not going to get into the psychosis of it all, but you have you know this live performance happening in front of you, and I I think the pairing of the live performance, um, something that's very grounded again on this carpet, mm. and something that is that's um, and I'll we'll say horizontal and linear, mm-hmm. uh, and then you have something that's 2D mm-hmm. um, coming happening at on a higher on a higher plane, yeah. and then the, obviously vertigo is about you know obviously. Heights and heights yeah. and um, moving up and down on a, on a, on a different plane. Yeah, um, just tangentially, uh, it made it, it made sense to people, uh, That's so and, they, interesting. and they dug yeah. it. They dug it. Um, you know, most of our performances are sort of are the audience is there more by happenstance. They just happen to be in the right. park that day or something. So this is one of the few venues where you know people make a plan yeah. to come, and it's always so nice to see. Um, I don't know, the community that you've built and how many people, like even though they could easily watch Vertigo in streaming form at home, how many people want to come out and experience an art entertainment w- around, with other people in a, a place. Yeah, and and, you're, and it's, it's, it's it always, an, I always feel like I'm producing two shows at the same time, but it's really one. Yeah. Um, but Because like, you know, there's the, there's the movie series and then there's yeah. the live performances, but are paired. So it's not like it's, you know, random, it's, yeah. it's random. It's it's, it's got to go together, and so you ask people to come. Don't just come see the movie. Come early and see the live performance. And they do, and I'm, they do, yeah, and then yeah. say so like they've like said they see. I saw you last year, so they know what to expect this time. Um, and so, uh, compliment to you and to your company and, and what you've built. Um, so, uh, I was going to ask you. Um, oh yeah, so getting back to kind of like the your work before we kind of move forward to what's coming in the pipe for you. Um, you know, from an outsider's view, which is mine, because I am not trained in dance. Only, yes, I did take jazz in college, mm-hmm. but that's a whole different story. And um, uh, and I was a, and I was an athlete, so I can move. Um, so Pigeon's performance style, like you said, it's it's coming from you and mm. your your work, and it's built intentionally on, um, again, my opinion only, uh, interweaving uh, improvisation and, like you said, the the choreographic phrasing, I'll call it, mm. of that smaller movement into mm. larger movement or mm-hmm. into and storytelling through mm-hmm. that smaller movement. So I'm curious to ask, as a dancer um, and the, and as a young person finding your way into storytelling, did you always have an interest in testing and playing with different forms? Or are you always like, because ballet is very regimented, as you were mm-hmm. saying earlier. It's a very, like, this is what we do. This is how we've done it for hundreds of years. And so I was just curious, because yours experiments. Mm-hmm. You have, you have, it's, it's, there's a playfulness to the work that, that, that breaks free from that. Yeah, I mean, for a period of, uh, well, if I go way back, and I won't dwell on that too much, but I went to a Montessori <laughs> performing arts school where we were uh, very sort of free and creative and encouraged to create our own shows and that was up until age 13 and so I had a sort of a a different outlook at that point but then I got into a pretty strict ballet training because I really wanted to do that professionally it's very competitive difficult and so I, I put aside unfortunately the um, my creative interests for a while and always thinking that I would get back into it and um I I guess in my early mid twenties I had the opportunity to do a few contemporary choreographies and to experience improvisation for the first time, which now is relatively late. But for ballet dancers at that point, that was yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people have never been asked to improvise in ballet yeah. dancers, and so I was terrified to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but then I didn't want to stop once I started, and so I really I felt drawn to do that, and eventually to to. To, to do not just improvisation, but to generate choreography from yeah. that. So I think it was, um, yeah, always something I was drawn to do, but hard to find the way to do it, hard to work around the the ballet aspect of right. it. Yeah. Is that how you create when you're as a choreographer now? Because you moving that hat. I mean, obviously you use yourself from your experience in your whole life as a dancer. Uh, I mean, without that, you wouldn't be able to be a choreographer. Yeah. So do you do you use that? Um, do you start from that that strict rote world? No. Or do you, No, I mean, I still train in ballet and I teach ballet also, although as you know, I am pretty experimental in my ballet teaching. Mm -hmm. I teach contemporary as well. And I teach the Feldenkrais awareness through movement. Um, 
where was I going with that? But uh, always a choreography for me starts with improvisation. Now, the ballet training is to keep the instrument in shape mm-hmm. because I, I do think that it's a it's not the only foundation for a dancer, but it is a good foundation for, uh, you know, um, maintaining your body so that it can go in many different directions. There are a lot of things that ballet doesn't address, but I, I, I think it addresses a lot. So I, I stay with it. But um, a choreographic process always does start with improvisation for me. A lot of times um, filming myself in improvising. Last night I was doing that in the studio and I thought actually I need to just like not film for a while uh, and just try and experience because I get very um, I get very interested in the in what it looks like Uh, and that's that is how I choreograph I film I evaluate what was interesting what was not interesting and sometimes it can be very hard to know when you're doing it what is interesting and so that's why I have the camera there but there are times also when, I'm, when I feel like, oh, let's just try and experience it for a how's while. How does it feel? Right? Yeah. Just feel yeah. it and see how it makes you feel and yeah. how it might make feel another dancer to do. Right? Yeah. But I have to say, like, there's, all, there, there's always that, that I in there that's trying to imagine what it looks like, too. Because that's my job. I was just talking yeah. to someone. It's like, it's very difficult to dance in a piece you choreographed, right? I, yeah. The, I mean, I... I stopped doing that very early once I once I realized how much more I enjoyed being outside of it and being able to you know not have to wait until I could watch and evaluate it's a very um, laborious process to be looking at the camera and then going back and adjusting so really only with the carpet series um, did I start dancing my own work again sort of out of necessity because there was no other way to create during the pandemic right. but but now also because it's based on solos I feel like I can do my bit and then I can be outside of it and I can right. watch the other dancers and evaluate and yeah well uh, the 2023 carpet series um, the theme was bodies of water mm, right sort so, of yeah sort of well it was no, it's, it, 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 as, much, as much as it could be right? as much as it can, as be, as it when can it's... be when you're on land yeah you know, i mean wait, like you didn't do you, you, there was no water ballet there was no there was no like you know in the hudson river trying to i think so yeah maybe a parent the inwood canoe club next year we could do something <laughs> yeah. i don't know but the carpet between two canoes you know water. where i've always wanted to do it is the um in inwood hill park there's this um maybe it's the part that's called Sherman Creek Park. It's a part of it that's maintained by Columbia University. It's like there's a dock out there. Uh, oh, sure. You know well, it's, it's um, yes, it is just uh, on 218 and Indian Road. At, uh, Close to the Mus- boathouse. Muscata right? Marsh, it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be so cool to put the carpet out there. I don't you know totally where, the, do it there. where the audience would be, though. They would Let's be a little later. Far. We could figure it out. The audience might be in boats. What's that? The audience, audience could be boats. floating. So here's the problem with that. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> that's all dredge. It's like literally a foot deep in oh, water. Oh, no. No, okay. it's all dredge. <laughs> it's all... Because that peninsula is man-made. Okay. Uh, they, they When they yes. cleared the Spite and Dival right? Creek, for those who didn't know, now Spite and Dival River connects the Harlem to the Hudson River. There's your history lesson, kids. Um, they moved a lot of that into... and uh, made that peninsula. Right, because Marble um, Hill used to be part of Manhattan. And exactly. So, yeah. It's still the same zip code, folks. Another piece of trivia. Um, but uh, so, yeah, when, when tide's in, you don't know it. You're like, oh, yeah, I go swimming here. And, <laughs> and true story, too, we used to do Shakespeare out there in the peninsula forever. And we and obviously, the, when we were at the Hudson pre-pandemic, we were, like, we were out in the park doing movies. And <laughs> people would get their jet skis stuck there and i believe you can look it up somewhere folks trivia is why uh, well, um i believe the comedian louis ck had his like yacht stuck there Uh-oh. um and he was like the people of harlem were so nice to me <laughs> i'm like yeah well i wasn't harlem buddy but um but we get the point uh, but yeah so the problem is getting people on on rafts or something yeah. out there um but yeah they just rebuilt all that out there we, we yeah it'll, it'll be hard to Maybe put you guys out there in some kind of high tide, figure it out. But boy, that would be bodies of water, right? I've wanted to do a floating timing it with, yeah. Timing of floating it. But yeah, maybe put it out there. Why not, right? Why not? They have, they can do their you know, boating club out of there. Why can't you do right? like a raft and, and put people out there? That'd be awesome. I'm totally for it. Let's do it. Um, so do you have a theme pick for next year? I do don't. I don't know yet. Do you, yeah. you have a post-it note somewhere moving around? <laughs> <and laughs> different ideas moving around? It's a good, I keep on trying to figure out what to do with it. How Because the, I don't know, our, in the arts you always feel like you have to like scale up as much as possible, right? To Just keep getting bigger rugs. Keep getting bigger, right? <laughs> but there's really, the charm of it is that it's small. And so I don't really know how to 
develop it and all the things that I'll I've micro. learned. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's okay. You don't have to know now. But uh, but I do, I do understand you, though, as a programmer and producer, hat on for a second. You're kind of like, okay, you know, it's, it's good to not get stuck in the cycle of like, this is what we do it because right. this is how we've always done it kind yeah. of thing, or this is what this is what works. I know it works, but I think if you go back to audiences again. If there is engagement there, yeah, yeah, and people there is, do yeah. want it. Well, I think that's your validity, right? You're saying okay, and the dancers mean something to you. Yeah. Your choreography, you're doing a good show. That's like it, you know when the formula is working, right. right? Between artist and audience. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I hear you. It's like figuring it out. I keep asking myself, well. I hope to have that moment where I can sit down with my post-it notes and figure out <laughs> what to do next year. I've been trying to just try to do this from time to time, right? Like headspace is important right. for artists, right? To have a, like where you're not just thinking about what you're doing tomorrow, but like right. how Do you things... ever get that? Are you allowed to have that? I mean, because you're teaching and you're <sighs> producing and you're choreographing other works, I'm sure, with other oh, yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's hard, right? It's to hard have, to like... just get the work done that you need to do this week. And right. um, yeah, and I'm very much... Like I, I react in the moment and I think that's one of my strengths as a choreographer is I don't have to have a, I learned early on going into the studio, I thought like I had to have everything all planned out and then teach it to the dancers. And quickly I realized that most of the ideas that I, I have in my head before I get in the studio are terrible, <laughs> but I can react in the moment and be like, well, that was terrible, but that gave me an idea for something else that I can see would work. So I can, I can work in the moment with the people who are there according to their strengths, but it also, it's. I'm not the, I'm not the person with the the five year vision necessarily either. Yeah, yeah but what makes you strong is that you're about best idea in the room. Yeah, you know, and you can yeah. say and with but with and without doing that work of your quote unquote terrible ideas, um, you wouldn't have a, to know to go to a, a new idea. Right. So, yeah, you have to have something to start yeah, you with. Got to build, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it makes me think. Sometimes it makes me think. Well, what if my well, okay, well, I develop a five year plan, but what if what if that's terrible too? <laughs> <laughs> but then it builds from there. But yeah, yeah, yeah it would but, work but, the same but way. But it's, it's hard. I think it is hard though coming out of the pandemic like we are. It's just kind of like, is it ever over? And you know, these new variants and a lot of people this fall got COVID that I knew and things like that too. And you're just kind of wondering, like, it's, it's a cycle of just like, it's a tether, right? You never feel like you're ever away from it. And yeah. So yeah, having that headspace to really going like, to a five year plan just seems so tenuous. Right. <laughs> going yeah. wow. How do we get there? Let's just worry about today, shall yeah, we? Yeah. <laughs> and what we're doing this month. Let's right. get out of this season first, <laughs> right? Um, well, uh, so what advice? It's a really good kind of segue because I always feel like this podcast has a little bit of an educational component to mm. it. And you teach, you're, you've performed, um, and dance is very unforgiving, I will say, as a, as a performer myself. You know, like you, our bodies have lifetimes and... And what we can do uh, with that time is up to us. So um, as an accomplished dancer who's transitioned to choreographer and leader of a company, what advice can you give those who are looking to break away to create their own work? Oh. Um, hmm, break away to create your own work. Yeah, I think to be willing to, uh, to yeah, well, I think kind of what we were just talking about is to try to plan as much as you can what you want to do but also be ready to throw away your plans if it seems like something if you see something better uh, if you see a better option right in front of you um be willing to throw away even what you thought was the the heart of what you're doing and that that's just about like creating the actual work but in terms of the practicalities of being an artist um i i think it's like um hmm yeah, I think like being willing to start small and always being willing to do things that are smaller, um, never sort of getting hung up behind like having to um, do something grandiose or this is my big statement that I'm going to make. Um, no, this is today's statement. This is what I'm this is what I'm doing right now with these people here. And it's like I'm seeing them I'm seeing what they're able to do. And yeah. Do you have a big statement to make still? No, I don't. I don't think I. I yeah, I don't think I have big statements to make. I mean, I have to pretend I do when I'm applying for grants. Well, that's okay. You have a, well, that's that's what your company's mission's about. Right. right? <laughs> but my point is, like, I think it's really great to say, like, you have your company, and like, think, like we kind of said it earlier too. But just curious if, if there's, you know, an overarching project you're working towards, just something like that. Because uh, I mean, it's good to have. Yeah. You don't have to talk about what's like your next thing, but uh, just I was just curious though, because it's. Um, 
you know, when you do form a company, it is very much about the work. It's about what's in front of you, like this carpet yeah. series we're talking about, and you know, the questions of like what are we working on now. It's really important. Mm -hmm. But is it if there was a, yes. a, a a bucket list project you have? You know, it's like it's not one specific project necessarily, but it's the. Um, uh, figuring out new ways for dance to be part of um, as many people's lives uh, as possible, not just the people who already know that they are interested in dance. I mean, we all, all of us in New York City want to, you know, be on the stage at the Joyce or City Center or something, and that, those are wonderful places, but there's also a lot of people who are never going to buy a ticket um, to the Joyce or City Center, but could really... Um, be interested in what we're doing. So like we did this um, film for the MIT museum. It's all, it's like about the DNA editing technology of CRISPR. And so we um, did a lot of work on how can we embody this technology um, as a dance film, which is a really strange and interesting project. And I did a lot of reading and preparation for it. And um, I, I, th I think that was one of the most special, unusual projects that we've done, aside from the carpet series, uh, one of the most unique things. And I, I will get emails from people who have been to the MIT museums like, and encountered this and were just kind of like baffled and also really interested to see dance in that context. And I loved doing that. I would love to do more things like that. Um, we're doing a project that is a, another project about water. It's kind of a long-term project with a piano trio, piano, cello, and violin, the Neve trio, and then a composer, Robert Sirota. And so we it's weaving together music and dance and also spoken text by oceanographers and naturalists. And it's just um, loosely, uh, not loosely, it is about the um, human connection to the ocean, the sort of awe and wonder of, um, of how the ocean works. Um, yeah. And sense more audience on pontoons for this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're doing so. We are this is my long term project at the moment. We have performances in Florida and Oregon at Oregon State University for the next oh. year, so it'll be our first like outside New York touring. It's a large evening length project and um, a logistical feat for, for us, for me to to organize. Um, See, I knew there was something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is what we're working on aside from the carpet series at the moment. But I think it's, you know, it's part of my interest, um, the intersection of arts and sciences, yeah. technology and dance. Um, yeah, and bringing new, everyone says this, bringing new audiences, creating new audiences for dance. Well, but, they're like the key, they're, that's like the core piece though, right? It's like without an audience, is there dance? Right. It's like a tree in the forest kind of thing falling. It's just the whole, it's like, what's the point, right? It's, and I don't even really care if, I'm not educating people so that they're going to buy a ticket for the Joyce. That's not really... You don't work for the Joyce. I don't work for the Joyce. <laughs> um be happy to perform there, but <laughs> her number is, yeah. um, <laughs> but you know, like maybe they'll never see another dance performance after they've seen the carpet right. series, but that's, uh, you know, that was their, that was their experience of dance and it meant something to them. Um, and likewise, the film at MIT helped people to, um, experience that the ideas of the technology in a different way. It added something to their life on that day. And well, I think if you don't mind me saying, you're performing in places like here, um, in Inwood, in Washington Heights, Bronx, um, that that do not come across it is incredibly meaningful. Mm -hmm. Kind of go where they ain't approach in a way, um, because I, I get it all the time for people when we talk about the Shakespeare Festival we had here and other things like that, saying you have, and I think New York is unique in the sense of that, you have a lot of educated people here who have seen Hamlet mm -hmm. and Julius Caesar and the Scottish play and King Lear and and do go to the Joyce and do go you know downtown to see a lot of culture and have means to pay for that culture. Mm -hmm. There are probably a hundred people for every one of those people right. who have never seen any of those people or have been to the Joyce. Yeah. And so those that's your audience. I mean, we, we, we did a show, one of our most recent shows at J. Hood Wright Park, um, yeah. not not so far from here, 175th nope. or yep. something. And it, it was like in the middle of the day. I didn't think anyone would show up, but people always gather somehow. And this woman, this older lady, I think she was, she had her grandchildren with her in a stroller or something. And she sat next to me and she said, is this an exercise? And I said, no, it's a show. And 
And somehow, like I, I realized she had never experienced anything of that nature before, and she was just astounded. That it's, it's like there's so many different worlds here yeah. in the city. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and it's and that's and, you, and it, it's disarming because you you kind of thinking probably I was I would be thinking because I get the same questions. And I'm like, of course not. It's this, and, and they're like, well, wait, oh, I get it now, right? I can it, watch this. I can watch this. Like, yeah, yeah I, you know, the kids on dirt bikes turning them off and st- they maybe sit for 15 right, minutes. Right, yeah, but that's 15 minutes. But 15 hey. minutes and they ever, they, they've never experienced it and they check it out and then they go off and they ride into it. Right, else. yeah. But that, you know what, you got them for 15, 15. minutes and they can, and they've, they've had that experience thanks to you. Yeah. So. Not every show has to be three hours long. Not every show has to be one hour long. Right. All right. Right. Which is a whole other idea to explore. Absolutely. Mm. Well, let's podcast for another time. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Gabrielle, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, very and much. we hope so. very much to see more of your work uptown. Thanks, um, before we say goodbye, where can we send people to find out more about your current and forthcoming work? Um, our website is pigeonwingdance.com, and we are at pigeonwingdance on Instagram and Facebook also. Awesome. So, listeners, you have your marching orders. Head on over there, and we'll include a link in the description of this episode. Uh, thanks again, Gabrielle, for joining thanks. me. And this pleasure to be here. Artist Spotlight edition of In What Artworks On Air. It's where you meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, dancers, and artists of all stripes to make their home here in Upper Manhattan. Uh, if you have a moment, please show us some love right now by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. That really does help us. Many thanks to the Church of Good Shepherd here for hosting us and to Heightsites.com for uptown promotional support. You can support On Air and all of our programming by making a donation tax-free to In What Artworks On Air Sorry, inwardartworks.nyc backslash donate or via Venmo at inwardartworks. Be sure to follow us on social media to keep all that we do, which includes the film festival, film work self fresco, pop art galleries, live performances, and so much more. Inwood Artworks On Air is proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, and Inwood Artworks programming is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air.